Hi, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is Cherie Burton. This is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. You can join our discussion on the Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group. Just ask to join that. And also head over to my website, CherieBurton.com, where you can find some emotional healing online courses and some other products to help inspire you on your journey. Today's episode is a really present issue for me, which is depression. Not only because I have little seasons or bouts or struggles with it, but I think just because most people do. And it's not something that we typically are very forthcoming about because of the social stigma. I think it's shifting and changing a little bit. But in some cultures, particularly those sometimes of religion, maybe those where there's an expectation to act, feel, believe, or be a certain way that sometimes there's socio-cultural issues at play that are very unique. I want to introduce to you Jane Clayson Johnson. She is the author of the book, Silent Souls We which I recently read and wanted to interview her because of her openness and candor about this as an issue within the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What she has done as a professional journalist is she's kind of like shown a light on the desperation and the darkness and the loneliness, just that reality of those who are kind of silently going through this. Her book, Silent Souls Weeping, Depression, Sharing Stories and Finding Hope. What she says is, I want to open a dialogue, a new level of honesty, authenticity, and hope for those who suffer with depression. We need to reach out and help each other and share our stories so that no one is alone in this struggle. A little bit about her background. I remember her when she was on nationally syndicated television. Um, She's co-anchored and anchored everything from the early show to World News Tonight, ABC, CBS. She's also on the nationally syndicated NPR program On Point. She's done some significant work in her journalism career and she actually has earned the coveted Edward R. Murrow Award and was honored with an Emmy. So I have another book of hers, I Am a Mother, that was published several years ago and it's been a source of inspiration to me and I'm sure many others who are kind of experiencing that life tension between a career and a family. One of the things we talk about in this episode is how comparison is the thief of joy and how we really do have to carve out our own path and find our own voices and really just take care of ourselves. I hope you enjoy this episode and discussion with Jane Clayson Johnson. Welcome, Jane. Oh, Sheree, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, you know, I... We talked about this uh, just previous to this uh, recording, but you know, your book, I'm a Mother, really struck a chord when I was sort of in that, oh, I guess you could say juncture. I was like, am I all in and either either or it felt like I had to choose between uh, family and career. And I think that your transition was just the affirmation I needed to, to move forward. And so I've always admired your work for, you know, putting your children before your career and as a woman who like desperately needs a career (laughs) like I have to do it um I I realized that I didn't have to choose either one I could do both and be both but this latest book Silent Souls Weeping can you just give our listeners just a general sense for um kind of why you felt compelled to dive into this topic of depression So after my own um, unexpected and harrowing uh, experience with clinical depression, I started to talk about what I had been through with people in my life. And I quickly realized um, how big of a problem it is and how many people suffer. And so as I was talking with them, I thought, you know, this is a book. Um, And so instead of talking with them, I asked to interview them because that's my training and that's my profession and that was my history. And I told lots of people's stories over many years. And so I decided, you know, I I started to talk to people and interview them and and this book was born. Oh, you know, and uh, I told you this, but it was a tough read for me at first because I didn't know your whole story. Um, You, you know, this whole you know, you feel the sinking happening and you feel the hopelessness setting in. And I've certainly been there, but, but the hardest, so I identified it with it personally, but really where it struck closest to home is that 
I saw my sister's story unfolding again before me because you did such an eloquent job of laying out, hey, this is, you know, I'm a woman of purpose. I love my kids. I'm spiritual. I'm on this path. You know, you're intelligent. You have all these gifts, but at the same time, you, you're blocked from it and it's darkened. And that, that was the course my sister was on. And unfortunately, she chose to exit this world with her, you know, leaving behind, behind her five children. And you chose to stay. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, how close were you? Like, if you, if you could just go back into that space, like, how close were you to quote unquote pulling the trigger? Like, you know. Well, I I, I didn't ever have a a plan or a mechanism for um, putting these thoughts and feelings into action. I just was in the middle of a very deep clinical depression, and I. I, I really just wanted to fall asleep and, and fade away. That's how mm. I just, I didn't, you know, it wasn't um, active. I just was so dark and down and sad and unexplainably um, touched by these feelings that I'd never experienced before. You know, I'd had situational, sad, situational sadness over the years, right? Like we all do, but nothing that a good cry or two or three couldn't get me out of. Right. But when I was in depression, it was different. And I describe it as being very physical. You know, I use words like uh, drowning and choking and sinking mm-hmm. and suffocating, right? And, mm-hmm. and it, it felt like someone had put me in a burlap sack and tied the top. And I, I just couldn't get out of this darkness. And the longer it went on, the worse it got um, until I, you know, was thinking, well, you know, wouldn't my kids be so much better off without me? And doesn't my husband deserve so much more than this, you know? And, and um, you know, it's, it's a very looking back of, of, it sounds crazy to me now. And at the time it did too, because I had such a a blessed life. You know, I I had this family that I'd always wanted and these beautiful children and a husband that was supportive. And so, you know, that was confusing to me too. Well, why is this happening? If I am so blessed, I felt guilty. Um, So that added to the problem. I hear that a lot. I, I attract a lot of women who, and because of my emphasis on emotional healing and, um, bringing pe- people back into their center and le- um, learning inner and outer alignment, following the passion and purpose. But when you're talking about that physical state where you just can't snap out of it, one of the most common things that I hear is exactly what you just said is that I'm so blessed. I have this, I have that. I've got these beautiful relationships. I, I've been you know, financially blessed, whatever it is. And it's almost like that adds and compounds to the guilt. Like, Right. You know, well, I think there are a lot of feelings attached to these emotions and attached to clinical depression. I mean, I tell my story very openly and honestly in the very first chapter of the book because I wanted people to know that I get it. I empathize. I understand how excruciating the experience of depression can be. And also because if I was going to ask people to share their stories with me, I had to be willing to share my own. And so, I interviewed more than 150 people for my book, for Silent Souls Weeping, and I, I heard a, a depth and breadth of experience that was quite um, awesome. I mean, it was just incredible, um, the courage that people had to share their stories with me in many different facets of life. You know, I talked to men, women, teenagers, children about everything from postpartum depression to um, suicide to um, kids and teens who suffer. There's a chapter on missionaries from our church who come home early uh, because Mm -hmm. of depression. I talk about toxic perfectionism as a contributor to depression. And I talk about stigma, you know, as um, a really um, uh, devastating aspect of of this illness that the fact that we just don't talk about it, that we're ashamed of it. Um, and, and that's part of my purpose in this book is to, to, to knock the doors wide open on this issue and, and start a conversation, engage a conversation on this important issue. Well, I love it. And, um, you and I are of the same faith, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, um, there are some, you know, if we're being real, I mean, you talk, you just mentioned missionaries, that's one component. Um, but there, I've, you know, I, 
just being in the trenches with this issue, um, I after my sister lost her life and I was part of the State Suicide Prevention Council here in Utah um, to sort of address the copycat issue amongst suicide for survivors and families. And, uh, you know, at the time, and I think even the recent statistics are the leading cause of death here in Utah for uh, teenagers, I believe it's ages 12 to 17. It's, well, it's the leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 24. Is it 15 in, to 24? In Utah is suicide, right? And the most recent numbers from the Department of Health suggest, Sheree, that one in four Utah teenagers has seriously, recently seriously considered um, taking their own life. And I just have chills right now because um, I was addressing this issue on the I guess you could say the traditional front of, you know, psychiatrists, professors, think tank meetings with like sociologists and people. But where I was climbing into was the heart of the culture. And I have teenage, you know, well, I have a teenager and then two young adults right now. And I can tell you, there is something happening. We're in the heart of Utah County, which is kind of, you know, they call it Happy Valley. But the reason they call it Happy Valley is because it's a pseudo... Um, kind of propped up, like, look how perfect and how many things I can achieve. Look how perfect, you know, my family is sort of that Pinterest Mormon sort of <laughs> facade. And, um, you know, you hear some dark comments like Stepford wives or homogenized culture or white bread Mormonism. And, you know, I've seen that side and, I, and this is not to denigrate the faith as a whole. It's only to say that something has arisen from I don't know, perception, cultural perception. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because you did cover it in toxic perfectionism. I'm yeah. here in Utah. I know you're in Boston. I'm a little, little jealous, but um, I love Utah. But I just, that statistic, I just, I want to, I want to get, I, I, I'll speak to it a little bit more in terms of what my children have shared with me. But what is your... Yeah. What you so I think I, I guess I would back up just one minute to say that there was uh, the the issue of stigma was common in nearly every conversation. This sense of embarrassment or shame attached not only to a mental health diagnosis but to the medication prescribed or the therapy required mm -hmm. for treatment, right? And this sense of, well, what have I done to cause this, right? Would mm -hmm. can, can you imagine if we blame somebody for having cancer or if we blamed ourselves for a cancer diagnosis? You know, it just would never right. happen. And so I think that leads into this notion of sort of toxic perfectionism. Like we can't admit that we are not perfect, that we, because we've got this facade and we've got it good and we've got everything going right. And my kids look perfect and my house looks perfect. And, and I am perfect. And I'm drowning. And I teach a perfect lesson and I look great all the time. And I, you know, and on and on it goes. Yeah. And yet when you scratch beneath the surface, as you say, we are drowning, you know, we are, because we're trying so hard to keep going, keep up the to prop up the facade. And it's really hard. I mean, I, I had devoted a whole chapter to toxic perfectionism because I heard it over and over again. And to be perfectly honest, Sheree, I'm a, I'm a, per, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Me myself. too. <laughs> High five. <laughs> right. So it was not a surprise to me that so many women, especially repeatedly mentioned in my interviews for this book, you know, the appearance of their homes or, you know, whether people thought of them. So I get it. I totally yeah, I get it too. But we have to understand how dangerous it is and mm -hmm. how it leads to, it is detrimental to good mental health. There's absolutely no question about it. And social media fuels this, right? We've got yeah. these carefully filtered and curated feeds Ugh. that show the happiest and prettiest and shiniest events in all of our lives. So we've got this desire to hide every flaw, to, you know, present this put together successful exterior and it's killing us. It is right. quite literally killing us. And I think the saddest thing to me is the emptiness that I feel in some settings within the culture. And I think this is true across all religion. I think most all women of faith and even those who are, who wouldn't identify as a you know, being on a certain religious path, but really have a desire to be on a spiritual path and to connect to God and 
and the universe, whatever, and however they define that, there's women seem to have, and I think women, you know, it's twice as common for a woman to fall into a depression than a man because we internalize our feelings so much. But in this respect, with the um, wanting, you know, you can kind of, <laughs> our female brains, we can kind of see the whole picture. We kind of have that inherent wisdom. And so we can see potentiality. We, we can see what's possible, if you will, and we can feel into it. And then there's this chasm, there's this gap between what we see and want, and we just can't seem to cross over to receive yeah. what we see dangling on the other side. And that, di- you know, that c- disconnect can create real struggle. Um, well, you know, I found a study by the American Psychological Association in the course of my research uh, for my book, and it was fascinating they looked at the link between perfectionism and suicide. And they reported that the link between perfection and suicide is stronger than we ever thought, stronger than previously believed, and and distressingly under-recognized. This notion of living an inauthentic life, the report says, I'm reading from my book right now, contributes to a negative self-view, a sense of despair, and imposterism, right? Mm. Fear and imposterism. And there was a quote from the um, study that said, perfection plus depression is a loaded gun. And wow. so it brings home just how dangerous depression can be and how fine the line is that divides clinical depression from suicide, uh, suicidal ideation, you know, thoughts of suicide and what contributes to that. And toxic perfection increasingly is evidenced as a, as a contributor to depression and to suicide. Wow. You know, uh, when you say the word imposterism, that, that brings up a lot of energy to me, like, Ooh, because, you know, my sister, she was, you know, she ran a music school out of her home. She, she was really gifted with people. She, um, you know, she had, you know, a big church calling or capacity and, and, she was, uh, we later found out, and this is like teaching her kids all this stuff about, you know, faith and repentance and all of these things. And we later found out through her journals that she hadn't prayed for two years prior to her death. She yeah. literally felt so unworthy, so disconnected, so shamed right. around her illness. And right. she also had an addiction to painkillers, which She had just been released from a 90-day treatment program. And I don't know, she never really relapsed. She actually OD'd on a drug that was used to manage her bipolar symptoms. She went to a hotel and left a a note. And I just, I will share this here that in the note, she had figured out in her mind that she was just going to be able to be a better mother as a guardian angel. Mm. And she did not want her husband to have to break their temple covenants and shame him. She already felt just like we'd all be better. You know, she, she had this sort of like, but also it was very impulsive. It was very impulsive. Um, just because of some of the things the police had found that she had purchased right before and just a scribbled note she left on the Ramada and stationary pad. So but yeah, the big, the big theme for her is I'm not me, this, per, you know, and I don't deserve this life. And I'm just a unworthy creature walking around in a body that doesn't deserve this life or, and the people around me shouldn't have to put up with this imposter either. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's so tragic. I mean, and, and honestly, Sheree, as horrible as your story is and as devastating as it is it is not uncommon and there are so many people who struggled like your sister and there's so many of us that understand what that feels like and there's so many who are watching from the outside trying to you know put it all together and trying to make sense of it right Right. you said that your sister hadn't prayed for two years you know, this is this was the second major theme that emerged in my interviews for Silent Souls Weeping. The first was stigma, and the second was what depression does to your ability to feel the spirit, to feel God's love, right? However you define that. Mm-hmm. And for, for me, depression 
blocked all feelings, including that connection to God, including the feelings of the spirit. So to me, this is the most distressing part of depression and, and why getting treatment um, is so critical. I mean, I heard from young people who would come to their parents, you know, crying. I've been praying, you know, more than ever. And I've been reading extra scripture and I've been asking yeah. God to take this away. And why isn't he helping me? You know, I mean, I, I guess that the message that I would, that I would say here is that depression is a disease of the mind, right? It's not a spiritual deficit. And, exactly. and we have to be um, willing to understand that emotional and mental health impacts spiritual health. And it all works together in how we feel about ourselves and how we live our lives. And unfortunately, you know, for some people who take that next step, you know, I feel like talking about these things is the most important thing we can do to help people understand that there is hope, that there is, that there is a path forward, that there is a way to get out of this and to live the most beautiful life that you can and that you're meant to. That's very well said. You know, when you're talking about this disconnection, you know, some people double down and, you know, amp up their spiritual practice. At exactly practices. right. Right. And, uh, right. and if I just pray more, harder, if I just pray harder, Sheree, yeah. I mean, I felt that too. You know, if I just go to church more, if I just serve more, if I just go to my temple more, then God will take this away from me. Would we, would we sit in a corner and pray our heart disease away? Right. We would not. We would pray and we would go to the cardiologist. You know, when you have um, diabetes, you take insulin, right? Your body mm -hmm. needs it. There are some people who need um, medication for, for depression, uh, certainly for bipolar disorder. I mean, there's so many things. The brain can fall ill in the same way that the heart or the kidney can, right? So we have to change our paradigm, change the way we think about talking about these issues. Absolutely. And, you know, the biggest thing, you know, when we're talking about perfectionism, and, and I think that you, um, you defined what perfectionism should be is about a, play, a state of being complete, finished or fully developed. I, that's why this podcast is called Women Seeking Wholeness, because I see wholeness that we're already whole, we just came here to uncover our wholeness that's already there through all the layers of earth and the veils and the darkness and the, you know, things we collect over the years, beliefs and whatnot. And wholeness is um, Christ, you know, the, I have a theory about the, the woman who went, had been to all the physicians in the scriptures and it says that I think it was 12 years only yes. to grow worse. I believe she had some form of a mental illness or a depression. It's that thorn in the flesh, even that Paul talks about later right. in the New Testament that just didn't go away, even to the most devout, dedicated, faithful people. But that woman, when she reached out and, you know, there's a whole process of, you know, that I've kind of broken down of, of, of like her state of mind, her state of belief, um, that she reached out and he felt the virtue leave him. In other words, he felt his power diminished because of her need right. and her draw. And so he turned and he pronounced her, you know, your faith has made you whole. Um, there's a lot of ways to interpret that. But for me, it feels like, and it says the woman was made whole from that hour. Mm -hmm. I'm like so fascinated by that. What did she actually walk away with? And it feels like that's what we're all just reaching out for that. You know, I talk about that bridge from the reality of where we are and the potential of where we could be and want to be. It's like, we're all metaphorically reaching out for Christ, reaching out for that. And right. it seems like such a stretch and it seems exhausting for so many people. Um, I want to you know, also I add to Sheree, yeah. that scripture in Matthew, Matthew five, be ye therefore perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, and I talk about this in, in my book, we've put that scripture on steroids you know <laughs> we're not meant to be perfect here mm -mm. it is mm -hmm. a process absolutely it, is, it takes a lifetime and you know I was talking to um, my young women yesterday in in church about you know even if you can only take one step 
that is enough. And the Savior makes up the rest. And that is what the moment's about. And that's what the scriptures teach us about grace. That's what I've learned in writing this book and in interviewing people for three years on this project about depression is that grace is a very powerful thing. And the more we understand it, um, the, the, the better off we'll be. <laughs> I've, always, yeah. I've always felt like that concept of grace, mercy, compassion, forgiveness is really undervalued in our culture here. Exactly right. It's, it's like, well, I have to do so many things before this grace kicks in. After all I can do, I haven't done all I can do yet. Therefore, I don't think grace can kick in. That changes. And all I can do changes every day based on that. It does. Maybe all I can do is like lift my hand and reach for exactly. the nightlight or the, exactly. you know. All I can do is sit up today and that's enough. All I can do is get my kids out the door today and that's enough. And the Savior steps in and he picks us up and he carries us the rest of the way. I think the biggest. Uh, one of the biggest things I see, and this is something I hear from my children who, you know, three of them have graduated, you know, two of them have graduated high school, one's graduating this year, and then I've got to start all over with the younger two. But what, that's one thing that they have, that I've really clim- climbed into to listen to them about is this shame piece, the shame. Um, and I think that there, there was a rush of suicides my, my, in my kids high school a few years ago. My daughter was actually contacted by a young man at two in the morning. Um, the morning he hung himself, he actually tried to call her. He texted and and she carried that around. That happened her sophomore year, I think maybe her junior, but she carried that and carried that and carried that. And they had a rash of mental health professionals come into our school here and um, even churches to try to talk to parents. And it was just a really dark time here. And one of the things that came of it is that um, there is such a, um, there's such a, I don't want, almost a compulsion to just put on this face because if you don't have this face that, or this countenance, there we go. If you don't have the countenance of Christ, if you don't have all this light in you, if you, if you don't have X, and I'm talking about teenagers right now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah if you don't fit the memorized scripts and you don't cross off all the checklists and you don't want, I have to tell you one of my, uh, one of my callings in, um, and I know they've disbanded this now or starting in the process of, but I was the personal progress, um, in, in our, in our church, for those of you who don't know, um, women, young women used to have to do all these things and check things off to earn this medallion. And then, um, a couple times a year, or maybe once a year, there was a, a, a night of excellence, and one, and I was in charge of the last night of excellence. And um, one thing I noticed is that the girls who had the grandest displays on these tables and who had all these achievements and all these beautiful works of handiwork or medals or works of art, um, I started to sense the sadness in the, in the more, in the, in the girls who had less pronounced talents, in the girls whose gifts were um, listening or compassion or meekness. And I, I was so disturbed by it (laughs) that I brought in this really radical friend of mine who um, I actually interviewed on the podcast about, um, about getting real and about, you know, just real, let's be real. Can we be real? And, um, it was so well received and I saw such relief wash over the faces of some of these girls. We did a lot of music and whatever. But the reason I bring that up is, um, I struggled with that because I was in between two sisters who were, who had stage talents and who had all these overt, you know, sort of like magnanimous gifts and they were charismatic. And I was just like writing in my journal and feeling sad. And I was diagnosed with dysthymia, which is sort of a pervasive, more low grade, mild chronic depression, which I've had most of my adolescence and childhood and which kind of floats over me a little bit. Um, I don't, I I have launched into clinical depression about three times in my lifetime. Um, But, but it's mostly this uh, really sad state. So back to the shame, it feels like 
shame to me in listening to my children seems to be the number one. If I have these thoughts, I'm not worthy. If I don't have this person's um, talent or this person's extroversion or this person's zeal to be a missionary, I'm not worthy. Right. Well, I think that's right. And I think when it comes to depression, I think, you know, this notion that if I'm not worthy, I think that can spiral very quickly into I'm not worthy to feel the spirit. I'm not worthy to go to church. I'm not worthy to pray. You know, so I think we have to be very, very careful. I also think, Sheree, and I would just add this sort of as an addendum, an important addendum to what you said about um, cultural and historical misconceptions about depression and about suicidal ideation. You talked about your daughter's experience with the young man who took his life. You know, I think for so long that mental illnesses have been perceived as some sort of character flaw, you know, something we could control or overcome if we just tried harder, you know, right. I remember one woman said to me, it's too bad. I can't wear a cast on my head because <laughs> something is broken in there. Right. Mm. Really hard for people to understand. So I say all the time now, this young man that took his life in your daughter's life and, and the, the many, you know, serious situations you've had in your own community with with depression and suicide and mental illness, you know, depression is real and, and it's not the result of some sort of personal inadequacy. It is not a black mark on your character, right? Nobody ever thinks that battling heart disease or cancer or any other serious condition, diabetes, you know, is, is never a matter of pulling up your bootstraps and, you know, fixing this with work and discipline. This is a physical condition. Suicidal right. ideation is um, a psychological condition, right? And just like any other physical illness, it requires treatment. There's help. We can talk about it. And I would mm-hmm. just add, you know, you brought up suicide, and I think it's really important to say that that talking that this notion that talking about these feelings of suicide leads someone to act on them mm-hmm. has been debunked yep. by a number of studies as well as by those who have attempted suicide and are now on the path to healing so they are dying to talk about it that's what they're right. dying to do they're right. dying but, to be out of pain and they need catharsis right. right and when you don't talk about it when you don't bring it up you are sending the message that you can't talk about it and that there's there's no way to get out of these feelings and so talking about suicide can actually help prevent it and part of my mission with this book is to shine a, a light on the need to have these conversations i want to take these conversations from a whisper to yeah. a song from a whisper to a song from mm-hmm. you know i can't talk about it to you know it's It's 100% normal. People struggle with this all the time. And you're not crazy. You're not, you know, this is not, you're not doomed. You can, you can come out of this and you can be well and you can be happy. And so that's my, my message with this book. One of the great quotes that I, um, that I used in the book is from a young man named Seth Adam Smith. And he's a love him survivor. And he said to me, depression thrives in secrecy, Mm. but shrinks in empathy. Depression thrives in secrecy, but shrinks in empathy. Mm. Sometimes people who are suffering like that, all they need is someone to just sit with them. Right. That's all they need. Right. Right. And you know, one thing that's really, I have found in the course of writing this book and interviewing these many people over three years is simply to rephrase the issue, Cherie. I I think we should not talk about mental health. I think we should talk about brain health. <laughs> I think mm. we talk all the time about heart health. You know, that's so right. important. Why isn't brain health just as important? So I have found that that removes some of the stigma, but I have to say more than anything else, 
we, we simply have to dive right into our stories without thinking too much about it. Everybody has a story. Everybody, when I go to speak now, since the book has been published, it doesn't matter if it's a crowd of 100 people or 2,000 people. At the beginning of each speech, I will ask people if they have suffered with depression or know somebody who has to stand up. And I kid you not, 95% of the room stands up. Wow. It is such a pervasive issue. Everybody has a story. So how do we start these important conversations? We dive right into our stories. We share our stories. Every person I interviewed for this book said that talking about their depression helped not only them, but it helped those around them, right? Yeah. To know that they're not alone. And that's what I love about a group of 2000 people standing up because they may have been reticent to stand up. They may have thought, oh, should I admit this? And then when they see people around them, they yeah, know they're like, that oh, they're- there's the, I need, like, I just got the permission. You know, exactly. that's so interesting. I, um, one of the things that I have, um, uh, I have perceived, and of course, I fall into that perfection trap myself, but um, there's a quote by, I think it's Theodore Roosevelt, who said, comparison is the thief of joy. And you had talked about, you know, Utah County driving through that there's all these billboards. I'm right there, honey. I live right there. I see all the plastic surgery billboards. I see that you can have the perfect this, you can have the body this, you can this, you can that. And uh, for me, that... Contra- the, I think the reason that it's called Happy Valley and the reason these mental health professional, professionals were coming in to sort of do this therapy work with our church communities and our um, school communities and the parents was to, to say that the reason that these kids, that there's this copycat issue, if you will, um, it's not, like you said, it's not because they're not talking about it. It's not because they're talking about it a lot and that's why they're copycatting it. It's because they think they're the only one who's not happy. Exactly. They see everyone looking so shiny and all this Pinterest and social media. Why right. am I suffering? And I think that there is sort of a um, a new wave, if you will, of of these I guess you could call them millennial, millennials and then the ones just under them talking about, I have a lot of anxiety today. I'm super depressed. They're talking about it more on social media, which is healthy. But when it comes to talking about it in the spiritual uh, um, communities, religious communities, it's still so stigmatized because there's right. these, these clergy and these religious leaders, they're not trained in mental health. Well, I think we expect too much from our clergy, too. I mean, I think, you know, we can't expect our bishops or whatever your religious leader is. We can't them expect them to be counselors and therapists. Absolutely. You know, they are they are our advocates and they are friends and they are our shepherds. But, you know, we can't expect them to walk us through therapy every Sunday. <laughs> it's just not their job. Oh, it's it's, but, yeah, it's but, not their domain. But, Bless their hearts. Have it, you're, having said that, having said that, there is, um, there does need to be a change or an acknowledgement or an understanding or an education about these issues so that when a religious leader sees it in their congregation, they can identify it and then you know, jump in, swoop in, ask that person um, if they can help them find help, right? Yeah. And not you know, not shame them or not say, well, if you just pray more, you know, this will get better. Or if you just serve your neighbor more, this will help. Certainly it will help, but only after you've received professional yeah. and, and, and I, medication. I, I think I see that more prevalent in those who are struggling with their sexual orientation. And you mentioned the LGBTQ community who have this rash of suicides within our religious community. And I don't think it's just the Mormon communities. I think it is also other religious communities. You know, you see the old gay conversion therapies and like fix this, pray this out, fast it away, all of that. And it's just, and they're, and they feel this hopelessness around um, feeling less than in the eyes of God, feeling like they were fundamentally flawed in their creation. Yeah, and- I say in the book that LGBTQ youth who are rejected by their parents, Ugh. and I think by extension, their communities, their friends, are at special risk for suicide. They are eight times more likely than non-rejected LGBTQ youth to attempt suicide. And they also report high levels of depression at six times the rate of those kids who are not 
um, rejected. So, I mean, I talk about this in the book um, as an effort to sort of highlight the idea that being rejected, you know, sort of being marginalized regardless of cause um, aggravates depression, right? The, right? the greater the isolation, the more extreme the risk of serious and even life-threatening emotional health problems. Yeah. And I, I just, we could continue to talk. I think that your research is fascinating and I, I love that you were so real around and open and vulnerable, not just with your own journey, but with going into these communities where we're just not talking about these things. We're not, there's not enough open dialogue and um, it's just put on your sweet face and, and show up and I well, think it's I've learned, refreshing. What I've learned more than anything, thank you so much. I appreciate you saying that it's refreshing. I, I hope it is. I, that's why I did this. That's why I wrote this book, because what I've learned it is that it is in vulnerability, Cherie. It is in having hard conversations that that's where the transformation occurs. Mm-hmm. That's where the change happens. And so you know, me being vulnerable, the other people in my book being vulnerable, you being vulnerable, talking about your sister, you know, these are, these are moments where people can say, ah, you know, oh, look at her, you know, she's been able to get through it. So can I, and when we talk about it, someone can say, oh, me too, you know, me too. And knowing, and, and I just, I just had a knowing that I'm going to share with you as you were talking. It's like so apparent to me that someone with your uh, professional prowess, because I always admired you. Um, I, I used to watch you in, on the, the morning show with Brent Gumbel. Um, and I, I just thought, oh man, she shared, you know, I knew that you were later, you know, he had joined um, and the, the church and I, my husband I, had, yeah. Yeah. Your husband. So so you I've were born a into it. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I kind of was like, she's living my dream. Cause I always wanted to be a journalist and I always wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I started a podcast. Cause I gotta do it. <laughs> but I, I also had this knowing as I've been talking with you that someone so strong and so beautiful and classy and sharp and sensitive that you had to descend into this experience to, to live depression, to be in the dark, mucky soup of that toxic, not only the toxic culture, but the actual physiological organic disease and how beautifully. And, and, you know, if you're like me, I'm always going to have to up my self-care. I'm not the kind of person that can let my self-care go or that dysthymia or depression, whatever you're going to call it. It's going to, it's going to race right in. Um, right. I see that as a gift. I, I because I Good have to. <laughs> like Good I if I just know that about myself. Um have you noticed that with yourself as well that that you- 100% and I think we have to give ourselves and we have to give other per, other women permission to do what you just said to have self-care to take opportunities to um to lift ourselves up and to take a break. And I know, believe me, (laughs) that is really hard when you have little people at your feet and, you know, uh, children who rely on you for needs. I get it. I, you get it too, right, Sheree? I, you know, it's so hard, but you have to find opportunities to do that, whether it's, you know, um, you know, trading your kids with another friend and so that you can have a couple of hours to go for a walk or go work out or do something for yourself. Take a friend to lunch. You know, I mean, these are all things um, that are really important and we have to give ourselves permission to do that for ourselves. 100%. Well, Jane, I admire your work. I'm grateful for this book. I'm grateful that it gives me an end to have more open and real and raw I still attract a lot of raw conversations with women. I still attract a lot of women who suffer. I self-published a book on depression. I'm still writing about it, still speaking about it. Um, and, and, And just also, you know, knowing that there, like you said, there is hope. And, and, and the reason there is hope is because of grace. Exactly. We make that the central focus. God's grace is enough. 
the mercy overrides the justice here. The mercy overrides my imperfection. And there's nothing fundamentally flawed about us at all. I don't care if you're trans. I don't care if you have, um, you know, a really dark mental illness. Maybe you're schizophrenic. There's nothing, nothing fundamentally flawed with us in the core of our creation and the seat of our None of us. None of us. It doesn't matter if you have depression. It doesn't matter if you are disabled in some way. It doesn't matter if you are have physical challenges. I mean, everyone <laughs> um, is loved and everyone is uh, entitled to the grace of God. And um, that's it, period. And I really appreciate you having me today. And thank you, Sharif, for your work on this podcast, for your openness and for your willingness to have this conversation uh, with me for your listeners so that we can all sort of join this effort. Let's, let's, let's bust this open. Let's have these conversations. Let's not be afraid lid off this. <laughs> let's blow the lid off this, you know? And um, so, you know, here we've started it. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's ask your listeners to finish it. Beautiful. Thank you, Jane, so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you. And thank, you. thank you so much. Okay. Thanks again to Jane. Just to let you all know, I do have a 22 day depression cleanse. That is an online course for $22 that you can find on my website, shereeburton.com. I hope you'll check that out. And I hope that you'll also know that there is hope no matter what situation you are in. If you're drowning, you feel like you're suffocating or sinking, just know that it is in you as an agent of power and sound mind unto yourself as a sovereign soul to be the master and commander of your body and to ask for and petition for tools and resources and people that can assist and help you on this journey. We're all in this together and we will continue to have these and other charged discussions on how we can assist each other as a community to heal and to find our own voices and power. Thanks for listening.